I didn't like. <laughs> I got my, my daughter, who's a graphic illustrator, to help me with it. But uh, we're almost uh, sold out on our first pre-order run. Uh, you can order it now, and it's just a, a real labor of love. So it's basically street photographs exclusively from New York City. Not that we haven't done street photography in other parts of the world, but that's my hometown. That's what really speaks to me. And you'll get a kick out of this because the cover photo was taken with a Fujifilm X100V. Yeah, and you know, as you were talking, I didn't even know it was out yet. I thought it was gonna be coming out soon. So as soon as you said it, I pre-ordered mine, uh, unbeknownst to you, and I just showed you the little receipt. Wrong site. That's a HughBrownstone.com. Let me get that loaded again. Three B. It's M E P. Three B M E P. There it is. Dot com slash books. And then books. Boom. Look at that. And that is a beautiful cover. And yes, I am a little happy that it's shot with an X100 series camera. I come on, I'm not, I'm not an animal. Come on. Now. Well, there were other <laughs> photographs that were taken with other Fujifilm cameras in there as well. I mean, we used cameras. We used so many different cameras because over the course of a year and a half, that's what YouTube reviewers do, right? Right. So, right, right. Uh, uh, a GFX100 with the 45 to 100, you know, as a street camera. Right. Of course, there are a lot of shots that were taken with. Because that's that's our personal our, our personal camera at this point. And uh, what else? Were there any shots by Sony? I think there were a couple. And uh, I think we actually used a couple of shots from the XT4 pre-production. Oh wow! We, okay, okay. Yeah, we did. We did. So we we also made a change. Uh, we wanted to have the highest quality possible, and we got the proof back from Mixum and decided, you know what? It mm. actually has a more premium feel if we dramatically increase the thickness of the paper and go to a soft cover because of the binding. So the final book is the same size, but looks slightly different. Amazing, amazing. And okay. there we go. So can you hear okay. me now? I can hear you now. Oh, beautiful. I don't see you, but I know what you look like, so that's okay. <laughs> the 30 seconds I spent hyping this up and getting excited, the Skype gods, they just, they laugh. They laugh. You make a plan yeah. and they laugh. Uh, let's get right into it. So thank you again for showing us your photo book. We're going to talk about that again because I have a few more questions. Uh, you also built a little live streaming solution for yourself in this time because you find yourself doing more of these. And instead of using your webcam, hey, you had a bunch of gear already available. Can you quickly run through your live streaming uh, gear setup and what you're using for your source? Well, first of all, I have to thank you because <laughs> th you made me feel really old because I oh, sat no. there and said... I to ask the young guy how to do this. I don't want to take the time to figure it out for myself. Let me just ask the guy who knows. So you and I had a conversation. And as it happens, I have a Fujifilm uh, X-T4 Pre-Pro still with us right. and a uh, 16 to 55 2.8. And the autofocus on the X-T4 is fantastic. Um, and so what I did is I got the cam link, the 4K cam link at your recommendation. Yep. And uh, so that's what I'm using. I'm now using the X-T4 as my primary cam for streaming and it's fantastic. But I also realized that even though I had have gigabit ethernet at home, last time we got together, it was via Wi-Fi. So mm -hmm. this time I hardwired in, uh, it's like a $10, $15 USB-C to ethernet adapter. So it goes right. into my MacBook Pro. And I'm getting upload and download speeds. I checked it last night using speed test of around 750, 850 megabits per second. So Ooh. that's awesome. Yeah. And when it comes to audio, uh, of course, there are two ends to audio. There's the mic, but then there's also the earpiece or the headphones right. or the speakers. And what I did is I now have, uh, and maybe I should get a little bit closer. I don't know if it makes a difference. Well, I know theoretically it makes a difference, <laughs> but I have the regular mic set up that I use whenever I record my videos at this point, right. which is a Rode NTG4 Plus on a boom just out of frame above my face. And that runs into a Tascam DR70D because no matter how good the best preamps are on any of these hybrids, the, uh, the preamps on the Tascam are better. So then I output that to the, uh, the X-T4 
Nice. And that's it. That's nice. it. It works really well. The oh, and then for uh, hearing you, I've got the Bose uh, Free Sports or something like that. It's a Bluetooth earpiece, yep. and I only have it in one ear. It's black, and that's on the dark side of the moon. It's yeah. on the shadow <laughs> side of my face because I like Vermeer lighting, Rembrandt lighting. Yeah. So that's that's the full setup. Yeah, that's all Beautiful. that I'm doing. Beautiful. And you know what? I see a lot of people using headphones and that kind of stuff, but I'm with you. I love this Bluetooth setup. And similar to you, got it again on the dark side here, just a little uh, AirPods Pro for the people watching. Uh, and it just makes it a little bit more seamless. There's no cables hanging out or any of that kind of stuff. So, you know, and, I'm, and thank you for sharing that because really it is something that once you get the key pieces, it makes a world of a difference, right? It, it makes a huge difference. And I understand and i can certainly hear the audio difference when someone is using a mic three to four inches from their face but it starts with a philosophical stance yeah, and my yeah. philosophical stance is that what i want to do is beam to the audience as if we're in the same room yes and yes. we're just having a conversation and having gear get in the way is not worth it to me. I exactly. mean, people basically can hear my voice. If they know me, they're going to hear it through this yeah. NTG4+, Plus, and I don't need a, uh, a different kind of mic. And one of the reasons I brought you here is to, to hear your voice and you say these things. And listen, I tell you this time and time again. I love hearing you talk about photography. It is something that I tell you all the time I see you. And this one specifically, I want to talk about, you know, studying photography. How do you approach it? Which direction should you go in? And, you know, we can geek out about this. I want to start the conversation on the importance of of studying photography you know a lot of people will pick up a camera usually it's their mobile device first in in this day and age and they may graduate into some sort of point and shoot or maybe an interchangeable uh, mirrorless camera or some kind but at some point i think it's important to go and study photography if you want to get better why do you believe that this is something that people should invest their time in and be a little bit more conscientious of well, I think it's a great question, so thanks for asking it, Gash. Now, we've talked about this before. I have a little bit of an advanced advantage. A little boy. My mother was uh, collecting v issues of Vogue when it was Irving Penn or Richard Avedon, some of the greatest photographers of all time, right. who also street photographers. They, they brought that discipline and that aesthetic into their work. And it's also the case that when I was a little boy, I was fortunate enough to get, uh, it was called the Time Life Series of Photography. And once a month, I would get a beautiful book. And we're talking, I wasn't even 10 years old. We're talking seven, eight, nine. Once a month, I would get a book on a subject. It was beautifully, beautifully printed and bound. And mm -hmm. one uh, book would be color photography. Another book might be... Uh, street photography or social photography, documentary photography. Another book would be all about light. So I, I always had that. But the, the answer to your question most directly is this. It accelerates one's sensibilities. It accelerates one's sensitivities, what to look for, how to assess, and how to find one's own voice. In other words, when you study photography, and for me, it's never just about the photos. I think that's really an important thing to say. Mm. When you study the context in which the photographs were taken, who took them? What was that person's life trajectory? Uh, for example, Henri Cartier-Bresson uh, was born into one of the 200 wealthiest families in France because his family owned cotton mills when that was the new thing. Mm. So he was able to see income inequality up close. He saw the dark side of capitalism. This was in the 19th century, and yet he took advantage of it. So he had what is generally regarded or referred to in books about Cartier-Bresson as a modest stipend. But that modest stipend allowed him to travel all over Europe and take photographs without having to work. And he became uh, a member of the Surrealist movement, which was a social movement which rejected basically the entire global contract between government and people following the disastrous World War I. Mm. He flirted very seriously with communism, as a lot of people in the 1920s and 30s might. 
his photography changed profoundly when he joined the French army in World War II and was captured. It took him three tries, but he eventually escaped. That profoundly altered what he took and his sensibilities. So it's important to see that. Some people understand Cartier-Bresson as the guy who created the decisive moment, the world's greatest street photographer, the one who started street photography. And those things are true. But most people don't understand that he actually hated, he hated the title of his first book, The Decisive Moment, because it wasn't nearly descriptive of enough, descriptive enough of the entire process. Huh. So, so you've got all of that going on. And when you study photography, so we're talking about books, we're talking about movies, YouTube is incredible for seeing documentaries, for example, that the BBC did in the 40s and 50s, or 50s and 60s. But it's also using Instagram uh, as a real tool to become a better photographer, because what we have available to us today is a dramatically faster workflow. Right, 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 right. I learned photography and, and I was shooting film. Triax is what I shot. Mm. And 76 was the film developer that I used. And Dectal was the paper developer that I used. You would take a photograph. You would have no idea how it came out until you went back and developed the film. And then when you developed the film, this was a negative film. So you wouldn't really know what it was like until you made a contact sheet. And then you'd go through the contact sheet with a loop. And you might not develop that film for weeks on end. And then All you right. might go through a series of test prints, dodging and burning, selectively changing the exposure, changing the crop. And then finally, you'd have an image. And you could measure that in days and weeks. Mm. We can now measure it in seconds, minutes. <laughs> and I, I recently put out a, a video on Instagram where I said, Instagram can make you a better photographer and a happier person. Got some uh, questions because, of course, their intellectual property policy is problematic. But still... There is tremendous value in seeing other people's work and putting your work up there on a regular basis because the simple act of putting it up and seeing other people's work will make you better faster. Anyway, that's my take. I appreciate that. I appreciate the insight. I love having you sort of communicate that, especially from your experience. I have to ask you, though, let's play devil's advocate. Isn't it not... What if I want to just practice? Is it not worthwhile to just continue shooting, to go and use the gear that you have and invest more time there and learn from your own photographs? Why should I go and look up other people's photographs, especially if I want to cultivate my own style? What's your argument to that? I think if your first premise is just to shoot because it makes you happy and you're not a book person and you're not a, a YouTube video watching person and you're not another people's uh, uh photographs viewing person fine mm -hmm. because in the end you photograph for yourself right you All photograph right. for yourself on the other hand there is something to be said for understanding one's own ignorance mm. there is value in having intellectual and artistic humility and if you think that your work is the greatest thing since sliced bread but you've never seen a slice of bread right you might want to you might want to take a little more time to think about what you actually have done of course of course uh listen before i move on to the next question it looks like skype is giving me perfect audio but they refuse to show me your face now so i'm gonna hang up again call you back again but in that time i'm gonna load up a few of these images you were talking about so just give me one second hugh all right let's try this again uh, give me one second. All right, I'm going to call Hugh back. And let's see if this connects. There we go. So, I don't know if you can see me. Well, I can't see you yet, but they can definitely hear you now. So, I don't know. That was strange, but... Um, it's okay. I'm going to get this loaded up. Well, yeah. There we okay. go. Okay. Yeah. 
And again, it's one of those things where people may not see the immediate value of studying a photograph, especially when you're looking at some of these photo books that are, you know, easily 80, 90, a hundred dollars sometimes. And some of them are even out of print, but all these websites are talking about how valuable it is and how much you can learn from something like this. Right. Uh, with that respect, I ask, you know, is it not better just to invest in your own gear, but you're absolutely right. You don't know what you don't know sometimes. Right. Well, and, and you can be so inspired by reading other people's work and seeing other people's work. I, I can tell you that my end, uh, Gash, I see that I'm not going out to you. I'm set up with Camlink 4K, but ah, there is okay. no signal. So, so I'm going to take a, a quick look here. No problem. On my end. But, I mean, when you read and learn about among Couchy, for example, the one guy who influenced Cartier Brisson, only one guy. Huh. Into perspective, but it's also inspiring. He was able to take sports shots in an era where there was no autofocus, which were extraordinary. Right, 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 right. A few moments later. Okay, I see you and you see me. Can you hear me? I do. I do. Okay. Okay. I, I I was telling the people I'm not gonna let Skype stop us. I will simply not. I'm simply not gonna let them. No, we're gonna have this conversation yeah. one way or another. And, okay. and and we're gonna have this conversation again in a few weeks when we switch. To <laughs> <laughs> the sh hey, you know what? The show only gets better every single time we talk. So hey, there's that. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, and that's and that's also something that's equally true for photography. You know, every photographer worth anything has taken hundreds of thousands of shots. Not every great photographer has had to take it, but pretty much all the great photographers have because you have to have a lot of stinkers in order right. to get the great ones. And when you think about someone like Robert Frank, for example, who uh, did The Americans in 1958, arguably the greatest photography book, the most important photography book of the 20th century, I think decisive moment is actually more so. Mm -hmm. But that's not politically correct these days, which is fine. He took 28,000 photographs. Jeez. Over a couple of years as he, he roamed the country with Guggenheim Grant. And right. he curated that down to 85. Wow. Wow. 85 I mean, out I of 28,000. <laughs> uh, it's one of those things where... I, it's this thing I come back to, it's the Ira Glass thing, right? Where your first photos are going to suck and that's because of your good taste, the good taste that you have and you have to keep moving. You kind of have to see through that and eventually you'll get there where that gap between your art and your taste gets more and more narrow. Hey, the story goes, maybe it's an apocryphal story, but the story goes that when John Lennon got his first guitar, it was mail order and it only came with four strings. So he thought <laughs> the guitars only had four strings. Wow, wow. You know, and when we talk about <laughs> Malcolm Gladwell and the 10,000 hours that yeah. one needs to achieve true mastery, well, why should it be any different for, for photography? Beautiful, beautiful. So I got to ask I you think, this. I think that we're great. It doesn't matter to me if, if we have issues here, except that it's uncomfortable for people watching, and we yeah. can apologize to people for that. Yeah. But I'm not embarrassed by it. We're just moving forward, and I yeah. think that's great. Yeah, and, and shout out to the people that are still watching. You're still tuned in. I truly appreciate that. I want to ask this, and it's probably a question especially a lot of younger photographers may have, is where do you start? When you say, okay, I'm going to study photography, and I want to take sort of the technical, the exposure triangle, the rule of thirds. I want to take that stuff out of the window. When you want to study photography and other photographers and really history, in your eyes, where should someone begin? Vermeer. Okay, okay, I'm writing this down. Go on. Vermeer was a Dutch painter Yeah. in the 17th century, maybe the 18th, I forget. But he was part of that school along with Rembrandt, uh, really understanding light. But that's not the reason to uh, study Vermeer per se. It's rather because I think he was the first street photographer. Now, I want to be very clear what uh -huh. I mean by this. His paintings, for those of you who don't know, are photorealist and yet super realist because what he, how he captured light, it was just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. It's so extraordinary that you have to wonder how he did it. And in fact, talk about educating oneself. In other words, what, what educating oneself means is 
responding to, giving into, uh, embracing one's curiosity, and it and you end up following so many different paths. So here's a recommendation for those of you who don't want to go to uh, school to study art history. Just go onto YouTube or Google for Tim's Vermeer because there was this a software engineer, I think, game designer or someone who was fascinated by Vermeer who believed that it looked like he was a game designer, actually, because it looked to him like Vermeer's uh, paintings were what he would create, uh, his company would create in video games. And he ultimately went on this journey and figured out that Vermeer used optics, optical devices to help him paint his images. And he was one of the first painters to paint ordinary street scenes. That's where we go with this. So there are mm. two things. One, he had photographic or optical aids, and two, he photographed street scenes, uh, rather painted street scenes. And prior to that, you know, Da Vinci, uh, Michelangelo, they'd paint gods, they'd paint kings, um, mercantile royalty, uh, that's an oxymoron, but you understand what I'm saying. Right, right, right. And it was uh, Vermeer where who began to paint ordinary people. Actually, he was painting the rising mercantile class, the, the nouveau riche. And that's where I would start. That's wow. what I would, where I would start. The good news is there's only another couple of hundred years before you're caught up to the present. <laughs> so it's actually a lot of fun to trace through the technology. Right, I mean, right, it really right. doesn't take very long. The fact of the matter is that that true photography began with a camera obscura, literally a pinhole in a wall. Right, right. In a wall of a building. <laughs> and from there, you get to view cameras because the image would be upside down and reversed. And you eventually get to a wet plate uh, collodion process and then a dry plate. And then you get to film with sprockets. And you very quickly go from around uh, the early 1800s you know, it's only 150, 200 years until you've gotten to the present. And so if you marry imagery taken with those particular processes, you now have a richness that comes from understanding all of history. And so what I say all the time to people who will listen to me is that I experience history, I study history through the lens of photography. I'm not trying to be clever, but that's literally the case. So when you get to uh, wet plates, you can finally be freed from having pinhole camera you're actually recording the image as opposed to just looking at it right, and then right. when you get to dry plates you can or e even with wet plates you can get into the field so you have matthew brady covering the american civil war in the 1860s okay using a field view camera and he was capturing the carnage of war the way no one had ever seen it before right and then you get to uh, uh, dry plate photography and you get to field cameras that the press would use. Uh, you get to film by 1900 and the brownie cameras. So you're democratizing photography using film, uh, literally film stock, yeah. which uh, had been taken from, from movie cameras, actually. Right, right. That film was created for movie cameras first. And uh, in 1914, you had the speed uh, graphic from Graflex, Graflex, and that became the press photographer's camera. And that brings you into coverage of World War One, coverage of World War Two. It brings you to Ouija, the crime and street photographer who was, <coughs> pardon me, a consultant to the uh, television series The Naked City, the movie The Naked City. I mean, it just the intersections are so extraordinary and rich or you look at edward hopper again going back to painting who was influenced by film noir in the 1940s and they were influenced by him it's just incredible you go back to 1913 when a young engineer who suffered from asthma mm. uh, and was an amateur film buff wondered if he could flip the film sideways and make a small travel camera so that he could go into the mountains and do photography. In order to do that though, with such a small image, negative image, the optical quality of the lenses had to be extraordinary. From the get-go, they had yeah. to be designed to be enlarged. And that guy was Oscar Barnack, and that camera, which he designed as a prototype for in 1913, was the Ur Leica, the original Leica. Right. But that was interrupted and not released until 1925 because of World War One. So it's just amazing how this all piles up and 
everyone builds upon everyone else. It's just right. an extraordinarily mind-blowingly rich thing. And then we learn, oh my God, the pandemic that we're going through right now? Well, economically, it's already indicating that it's gonna be worse than the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. But then you go back to the Great Depression and you see that the Farm Security Administration was set up, run by Roy Stryker on the photographic side, and uh, who in turn hired uh, photographers like Dorothy Lang or Elliot Erwitt to take photographs of other Americans who had been hit so hard by the depression and the Dust Bowl. We didn't demonize people who were less fortunate than we were. Our government worked mm. to actually generate sympathy for and wanted to help them. It's 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 almost gash. I mean, I know I'm going off on a bender here, but I feel please so do, strongly about do. this. It's, it's it's almost as if we have an obligation to understand history. And it's only been in the last 150 years or so that we can understand it at a profound level because we've had photography, really, mm -hmm. just for the last 150, 170 years. And now we have the internet. And to not study that, I, I actually experience as irresponsible. Right, right. And, and thank you so much for bringing that up because I'm just like here frantically taking as many notes as possible. And for those of you watching live, I mean, you know the value in that and having someone kind of guide you along and point out these names. And I remember being introduced to Vermeer in grade eight art class and scoffing at it and like, let me just get this assignment done. I can I know how to do a sketch. And, you know, you just think about the pearl earring painting. Right. But it's not until you kind of walk in with a little a, a more openness and, and wanting to know where this all came from that you really start to garner an appreciation for everything. And all these problems you're trying to solve as a creator now, you see that there's so many of those problems and more that were solved hundreds of years before you were born. And there's so That's much right. value in That's that. That's right. And, and it also helps you understand what you're seeing today. So now we leave the realm of studying photography to be a better photographer and entering the realm of being a better human being. So, for example, Alfred Eisenstadt, one mm -hmm. of the original uh, four life photographers, uh, has did two pictures of a kind of smarmy looking guy with slick back hair. These were not art. This that was not the purpose. But one is a picture of the guy and he's smiling and he's sitting in a chair and uh, it's just really a snapshot. It looks like he might be looking at the photographer, but if you look closely, he's looking just off to one side. So he's oh. not actually talking to the photographer. The very next photograph, he is looking at the photographer and he doesn't like the photographer. Wow. He doesn't like the photographer. But here's the thing. That guy I'm talking about was Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda minister for Adolf Hitler. And in the oh. second photograph, someone has just let him know that a Jewish photographer is taking his image. And wow. this is not about Jews, it's not about Nazis, but it is about the human condition. It is about demonizing people. And it is about recognizing fascism. Right. And it right. is about recognizing propaganda. And being able to draw those kinds of distinctions right now, today, in places around the world is critically important. Mm -hmm. Rant over. There you go. Thank you for that. I need to ask you this because we are getting this question in the chat as well. And something I want to ask you is where are the best sources to start this research? And armed with, you know, your great exposition there, a few names, moments in history. What are the sources? Is it just a Google search? Are there better places to go? Or is there places that you'd recommend more than others? Well, you know, one of the, the people on YouTube who I think is terrific for this, who is a friend of mine, is uh, Ted Forbes and the oh, art yeah. of photography. You have oh, to yeah, go exactly. back a number of year, years, but uh, he did the, a, photo a series on photographers, and I think that's fantastic. He was the one who introduced me to Fan Ho and mm -hmm. uh, Martin Mancacci, so I, I think that's fantastic. But this sounds so old-fashioned, but wouldn't it be amazing to actually call up your local library, because we're all social distancing right now, yeah, yeah. and get a librarian on the phone yeah. and just say, hey, I'd really like to learn about photography, photographic history. Where do you suggest yeah. I start? Now, with that being said, 
uh, we do uh, street photography workshops in New York City, and that is actually part and parcel of uh, our workshops. I go through a history of photography, and it's abridged, like you abridge Shakespeare, because there's so much in it. <laughs> of course. But uh, I, I think that's fantastic. Or I don't know if, if there's a good set of these available, but you just, I mean, you can also just go to Wikipedia. Right. And right. just start with photography. And they have hyperlinks that will take you back and forward. And I think that's fantastic. But then it gets even better because you learn things like, so who has the best autofocus today? <laughs> Can we agree which manufacturer has the best I th autofocus I, I today? I think it's Sony. I think they have the best on the market right now. It, yeah. It, 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 they, they, I agree with you, Gadget. But here's yeah. the interesting thing. Where did they uh, first get their autofocus technology from? Do you know? I don't know. I could guess. I guess. Didn't they buy Minolta? Didn't they kind of take over? Very good. Very good. They bought Minolta. And Minolta had the autofocus technology. Ah, uh, okay. Where okay. did Minolta get the autofocus technology? Oh, I, I would not know. I would not know. No, I have no idea. Well, here's an interesting thing. If you go back far enough, you will find that Minolta did a joint venture with Leica. Among other things, they no introduced way. the Leica CL, and it was yes. actually Leica who invented autofocus, who then said, we don't think anyone is ever going to use autofocus, so they sold it to Minolta. Wow. I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. But it's amazing. You know, it's, yeah. it's just so rich. It's so rich. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. OK, listen, I, I, <laughs> this is this conversation is always very tempting because you'll you'll present one of these threads that I want to go down. But then I have these questions that I need to ask in the chat. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to get to this. I'm going to get to this. So let's say you find these photographers. Let's say you go, whether it's your library, whether it's online, whether it's Wikipedia, whether it's even photo books. By, by, by the way, of course, you should also go to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and you can go online there, yeah. and you should add, the you can only start, it, yeah, yeah, and then um, there's Magnum. <laughs> I'm writing all of these down, because I want to make sure they're in the description of this video, so if you're watching this, check the description, you'll find all of these. When you look at a photograph, how do you study a photograph? I know it's a very open-ended question, but I'd like to ask you this question in your eyes. How do you study a photograph when it's right in front of you? What are you looking for? What are you trying to dissect? And how do you process that? Well, the, the first thing is, does it evince an emotional reaction mm. in me? Uh, or does it catch my eye? If it doesn't catch my eye, my heart, or my head, I don't care. Gotcha. And that's just me. I, to be clear, I, I really want to be clear about this. When it comes to art, yeah. I say this all the time. There is no such thing as objectively great art. There is such a thing as objectively great craftsmanship. Right. But, but how one interacts with an object of art, whether it's a film, a photograph, a sculpture, a painting, food, a car, a piece of equipment in your hand, it is a function of the relationship between the art and the viewer, the consumer of it. And that, in turn, is based on the lifetime of experiences up to the moment that human being interacts with that piece of art, right? Yeah. So one of the things, if you're a street photographer, if you're, let's say if you're a landscape photographer, you start with Ansel Adams. Just, yeah. you absolutely start with Ansel Adams. If <laughs> yeah, you're a course. street photographer, you absolutely start with Henri Cartier-Bresson's 1952, The Decisive Moment, uh, which by the way, he was French, for those who don't know that. And uh, it was originally entitled Images uh, à la Savette, uh, which basically translates into images on the run, mm. or I reinterpret that as stolen moments. But if you read, if you don't look at the pictures first, if you read the words first in the span of what, 15 pages, I think you have an incredibly rich way of thinking about and looking at photographs. Because it's not just the decisive moment, again, we're using street photography as the example, but it's about juxtaposition, contrast, geometry, shapes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. context, substance. And there are some images which are ordinary in terms of drama. That is, mm -hmm. that is uh, 
uh, graphic drama, you know, light and shadow or geometry, but they are incredibly rich in terms of human drama. Right, 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 right. And there are some photographs where the rules are violated in the geometry and angles, but the photograph is extraordinary anyway. Yeah, yeah. I I'm glad you brought that up. And, you know, it reminds me of something I heard from a high school teacher is that many people in a room will agree what a good hammer is, but not everyone's going to agree what a beautiful hammer is. And, you know, it's one of those things that kind of sticks out, right? Where it's just like, oh, yeah, like, yeah. you don't have to love a great piece of art. Everyone is entitled to kind of feel how they feel when they kind of when they perceive it. Right. But uh, and yeah, I think that's exactly the beautiful right. thing about it is that we get to talk and dialogue about what makes something beautiful or not. Right. Um, yes. And, and the thing is, Again, we go back to intellectual humility and emotional maturity. Mm. Just because you don't like something doesn't mean that it isn't wonderful to someone else. Yeah. Uh, my favorite movie of all time is Casablanca. I can't tell you how many times that I've watched it. Claudia refuses to watch it with me anymore. And I love her. <laughs> she's got great taste. But, you know, how can you not watch Casablanca an infinite number of times? I yeah. don't know. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Hugh, thank you so much for your time. We're going to jump into Instagram just to do a quick Q&A. Before we go, I want to plug two things, and I'm going to let you talk about them. One is the photo book, which I just pre-ordered. If you weren't watching at the top of the show, it's like the first thing I did before we started this live stream, and I think you guys should check it out. Uh, so, Hugh, where can people find this book, and how can they get access? Well, thanks, Gaj. Uh, it's called Streets of New York, the book. Uh, it is now available for pre-order for shipping at the end of this month, beginning of May, uh, at www.3bmep.com slash books, B-O-O-K-S. And then uh, even even though we're, we're oversubscribed for October, uh, we did have to cancel our March workshop, but we have a June workshop with two openings. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can check out our workshops and just get a, if if this year doesn't work for you, just think about it for next year. That's at www.3bmep.com slash streets2, which is fantastic. And we do that in partnership with Hasselblad, Adorama and Sol Digital. So we have some Amazing. great sponsors for that. Amazing. Amazing. Hugh, thank you again for your time and your patience. And thank you guys for watching for your patience as well. I enjoyed the conversation. And uh, guys. listen, guys, we're going to jump to Henry's camera on Instagram. If you have questions, this is your chance. You can pop in, ask your questions as well. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time.